Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. This is episode number 25, a milestone by anyone's standards, certainly by mine. I can't even begin to comprehend um, what's occurred. And certainly for the very, very special episode 25, I can't even begin to comprehend the guests that I have for you this evening. Um, nothing short of spectacular, albeit a Herculean effort to get scheduled. Um, it's It's truly unbelievable. And I can't wait to get going. But first, I, I want to take just a minute out of what would be my standard introduction um, and appreciate the, these these 25, 25 as of tonight, and what a 25 it's going to be, and, and counting, hopefully, um, very precious, meaningful creations to me. And that that is my 25 episodes that I've made of this show um, so far. You know, when I set out to create the show, I didn't think it was really going to go anywhere miraculous, too terribly far. You know, a couple of episodes, you can verify this with my wife. I said five. I said five. A um, couple episodes, couple chats with a couple of amazing people, and that was going to be it. I didn't care if, you know, they had been in the presence of Tom Colicchio in person the night before, or they had just made dinner for me hours previously or you know i had even gone to school with them i just i didn't care i wanted to enjoy this show um that that i was doing this vehicle um and hear some stories and share those stories with the rest of the world and share with the rest of the world the fact that food was art and and, and chef was artist take all the celebrity and all the fame away you know chef as artist, food as art. That's a concept that was simple enough to me, but, you know, people are learning this. People are appreciating this, and it's new knowledge to some, and I think that's amazing. Um, and so th through all the guests, through all the episodes, you know, I'm no Letterman, I'm no Fallon, I'm no whoever else you want to say as far as an interviewer goes, but I totally get when they, like I'm trying to meagerly now give credence to the guests without all of you um certainly tonight's guest but without all of you this show would not have been possible it would not be where it is tonight and i can't thank all of you enough um for for being a part of it so from the bottom of my heart and i mean this thank you so very much all right so moment over let's move on let's talk about tonight's guest let's talk about episode 25 um it's not all that often that luck is a catalyst for a career and you know it's not all that often that fame doesn't turn people a bit I don't know prickish and it's really not all that often that those chefs turned celebrities are genuinely and sincerely nice and I can say with certainty that through weeks and weeks of talking with tonight's guest starting with the end of last season of the show hint hint and trying to get things set up he was nothing but nice but Nice Guy Chef is barely even the surface of tonight's guest. Those who haven't had the pleasure of speaking with him would know him by other traits. Culinary competition show winner, restaurant creator and innovator, culinary competition show host. His long list of accomplishments reflect the incredible skill, savvy, and personality that he brings to the table. Pun completely intended. Again, I am nothing short of amazed that he is here tonight. Uh, but a busy chef means a busy schedule. So why waste any more time being cryptic? Let's pull the sheet back, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone in between. My guest this evening, the winner of Top Chef Season 2, the host of Esquire Network's incredible knife fight, and truly one of the most fan-friendly chefs you'll ever have the pleasure of meeting, albeit digitally in my case, the chef, Elon Hall. Chef, how are we doing this evening, sir? I'm I'm great. How are you, Sean? Fabulous, fabulous. Again, thank you so much for taking time out of your extremely busy schedule. I am loving the living hell out of season four so far. Thank um, you. Just, just as a side note entirely. So um, for folks tuning in for the first time, and, and for you, Chef, three sections of questions. We have starters, we have mains, and we have afters. Starters are w about where you came from, you know, your background, mains, <laughs> where you're at, what's your five-year, and afters, some more off-the-cuff stuff, but no one's ever been injured during the course of an interview, and I don't expect that to happen tonight. Okay. So without further ado, sir, um, tell me about where you grew up eating. Wow. Um, I grew up eating actually kind of all over the world. 
um, I mean, I grew up in New York and Long Island, but um, we traveled a lot as a family. My parents are both immigrants. So, um, you know, traveling to Europe, traveling to Israel were really sort of big, big things in our life. I mean, even, you know, in the younger years when my, my family didn't have, uh, you know, tons of money, traveling was always the the way to the way to vacation. I mean, going, going abroad. Um, I mean, my first, I have a lot of food memories, but my first sort of, you know, a lot of chefs say they have this sort of this transitional moment where they, where they view food as something else. Mine was in, in Greece when I was a kid and, um, I always ate everything, but, uh, having fried calamari did something to me. <laughs> we were, we were staying in a, um, a small Island in, um, in Greece called Skiathos. And I just, there's just tons of fresh seafood, and I, I wasn't really into fish, fish like flesh fish per se when I was a kid. But something about fried calamari, I know it's it's sort of people's segue into seafood, but for me, it just it was something special. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, and obviously, you know, as a young one, you're eating fried calamari. You were, I can assume, probably not a picky eater. No, not at all. Not at all. Good and open to it. Are, are are there childhood foods? You know, you mentioned that fried calamari kind of being that moment that broke you out. Um, looking back to your childhood, are there moments? Are there foods that you miss, like you know, almost as much as a person, as a place? Foods that I miss? No, I mean I'm I'm in a position where I can kind of eat anything that I want, and being in New York City, I can kind of fulfill every culinary desire that I have. Um, so it's, it's, I'm kind of, I guess I'm spoiled in that regard. <laughs> I mean, I can eat, you know, I, I also grew up eating, eating a lot in Israel. Um, you know, we were, we were exposed to, to really incredible stuff. My parents used to live in Israel. My mom was born in Israel. And, um, and so Israeli food to me is, is one of those things that, that really just, you know, is, is like home to me. I mean, we always had, we, we grew up in a, in a Jewish neighborhood and we always had access to, to really amazing um, Israeli products, and I've been to Israel, you know, more times than I can count because I, I have a lot of family there, mm -hmm. and so that was that's sort of like my my home base, right on food wise. Right on. So uh, you had you had all these amazing foods, and you have them all now because of your location. And if you watch um, Knife Fight, for example, you see beyond amazing foods. But looking yes. at people, was there somebody growing up that you looked to? Um, sort of as your culinary influence? Of course, my father, 100%. My father uh, still is the cook of the house. Um, even though my mom, my mom's no longer working, my father still cooks dinner every single night for her. And, um, and so it's, it's one of those things that, that he just, you know, he's always done. And he, he, it's funny because he's from Scotland, but he doesn't really cook Scottish food. He cooks more Mediterranean food. And I guess that was my sort of baseline, um, you know, Growing up, we would have fish a lot of the time of the week, you know, multiple times a week because there was a local fish market. And that was actually my first job in food uh, in high school. When I was 14, I started working at a local fish market. And um, and my father is the person who really started me cooking. I mean, I had a few other influences. My cousin, who's an incredible chef, who um, trained under the the incredible Raymond Blanc at Le Manoir au Quatre Saison in England. Um you know, Michelin star chef, you know, Michelin restaurant, like that sort of thing. He gave me the, the other, the other side of what the industry could be. But my father just inspired me to cook because I just loved the way he, he did, you know? That's awesome. And, and, and you said working at the fish market was your first job? That was my, my first, I had a couple, I like, I did, you know, snow shoveling and stuff like All that, right. but, right. but, um, but that was my, that was my first job where I was, I was touching food and, um, and so that was really it. That's what got me. That's what got me into it and got me got me started. It started me thinking that that it could be a career for me. For me. That was it. That was the moment. Wow, yeah. that's that's awesome. You know, because a, a, a fish market seems seems daunting even to me at 38. And you know, yeah. I, I'm I, I can function in the kitchen. I'm not you know, you know, trained or anything, but I can function. But still, to work in a fish market, that's that's just that seems overwhelming. And yet, you probably got such an education at that point. I did. It's, it's a shame though, cause I don't fillet fish as much as I used to. I was so much better when I was a kid. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so let's bring it forward now. Obviously, um, you know, Top Chef, the Gorbals, Knife Fight, all this, you, you're obviously 
I can probably assume living the dream. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> I mean, you, you're if if you had gone back to that fish market when you realized that you wanted to work in food, could uh -huh. you have imagined being where you're at right now? Um, I get. I don't. I'm not sure. I mean, it's it where I am right now was a lot of was a lot of work and a lot of you know a lot of different jobs and a lot of a lot of sort of trying to trying to position myself in a place where I could get the best education. Um, you know, and, and I say that, you know, I, I did go to culinary school. I went to, technically I went to three different culinary schools. Um, but I feel like my real education started when I was working in, in high volume fine dining restaurants. I think that that's the best, the best education that you can get, you know, being in a position where, where you don't know if you're going to be able to make it and you don't know if you're going to be able to put food up on time. You don't know if your station's going to be clean enough. You know, it's, you're constantly under the gun and you're, you're never satisfied and you're always, you're always slightly uncomfortable to the point where, you know, I think, I think that's really, that's really where, where it happens. But I, I don't know. I, I don't, I didn't really think about where I was going to be at any particular moment. I knew I wanted to open restaurants at some point. Mm -hmm. um, the TV thing was an accident on both ends, oddly enough. Um, I mean, I was, you know, going on Top Chef, I didn't, uh, what, I didn't have cable, I didn't watch TV. My, a friend of mine, you know, loved, loved Top Chef the first season and said, oh, you should try out for the show. And I said, yeah, sure, what the hell, you know, I'm 20, 24, what, you know, what can I, what can I lose? Right. And right. so I tried, and um, I tried, I tried out for it. And the funny thing is that I, I sent in a video Mm -hmm. of myself in my apartment because I didn't have, um, I missed the open call. I thought it was this one day and it, it happened to be the day prior. So I got all dressed up and then I checked the, the address and then, um, then I, I missed it. And so I bought a video camera at Radio Shack cause they had a good return policy, made, <laughs> made, made a video and then sent it, um, sent it in and returned, returned the video camera back. And what was funny is that they asked for a second, a second tape where they interviewed me on the phone while I was videotaping myself. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I had to buy, buy another video camera at the same radio shack. And they looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> awesome. awesome. So that was, that was kind of accidental. And then once I was there, I mean, it was, you know, I know you don't want to talk about top chef too much, but it, it was kind of, I looked at the whole experience. Like I was at summer camp. It was kind of this, this fun, weird environment where you're competing, but everybody's sort of similar to you and you're doing the same activity. Yeah. And, um, and I think not caring if I, it's not about not caring, but I wasn't really worried if I would were to lose, I would just go back to my job, which I loved, right. you know? Right. And right. So you had a backup plan and, and, and that was really in its infancy. And just, to, just to be clear, I, I don't want to, I didn't want to necessarily go down the top shift line. Cause I don't want anybody on here from top chef to think, like that's it but it's a really interesting story and like you said season two i i don't even think top chef really you know became the the monolith that it kind of is now and it did it seemed like you guys were having fun yeah that's yeah, awesome. it was a blast that's awesome and, and and you said that that knife fight was an accident as well Knife fight was just, I mean, you know, from being on Top Chef and while I was still working at Costa Mono, we used to have these little fun competitions, which actually, um, I hear that lots of other chefs have, uh, have done that also just, yeah. just for fun, just to sort of, um, you know, at the end of service, you know, while you're cleaning up little five minute battles with leftover mise en place that you throw away. Yeah. And, um, and so we used to do it and we would have, you know, one of the servers tasted it, another cook tasted it, and so it would just be like this fun little quick thing. So I was really inspired by that because I'm a competitive person. However, I'm I've never been an athlete, uh, so so sports were never my thing. Right. Um. And so it was just something that I'm like, well, I used to do this thing. I have my own restaurant. Why the hell not? Yeah. And yeah. then a friend of mine who was a who was a director was looking for show ideas and we were trying to come up with something that we actually turned into another show that I'm not on but I, I produce. And um but you know, I said, Well we do this thing at the restaurant sometimes, just sort of randomly. Do you wanna do you wanna shoot that and see what happens? And that was it. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And, and so were you doing this at the Gorbals prior to the show being created? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were. Yeah, we do it. We would do it just for fun between line cooks. If there was a, you know, a chef, a local chef friend in the house, we would just sort of mess around. 
you know, with leftover stuff. We wouldn't buy crazy things, but my restaurant had crazy things in it. You know, we'd have lots of pig heads and bits and pieces from, you know, local local farms and slaughterhouses. Like Southern California was a, is a great place to sort of get get a lot of cool produce, cool um cool things. Our fish purveyor was amazing. Um uh you know, Kauai at IMP. Mm-hmm. which is in downtown LA, like one of the best, I mean, all the best sushi restaurants in LA get, get their stuff from there. They fly stuff straight from Japan, you know, local stuff, combination of things. It was, it was just, it was cool. So I, I always had lots of interesting things and that because the restaurant was small and because I am in complete control of it, I would just do, do one off things. So I would get like a whole King salmon. I would do something with the head, do something with the tail, you know, cure the belly. Like I would just mess around and that messing around led to having lots of cool, interesting things in, in, in the walk-in. That's so cool. That's so cool. Yeah. So, so w- looking at you in, in the restaurant, taking the, you know, taking the shows back now, um, where do you, when you cook, draw your culinary inspiration the most from today? Obviously, growing up, your father was your, was your kind of culinary springboard. But th- today, Chef Elon Hall draws his inspiration from where? Um, it's weird. Cause I, I kind of, I draw from a lot of different places. I get inspired by a lot of other, other chefs in New York city and all around the country. I mean, LA is doing some amazing things right now. Um, so there's some, there's some really great chefs. Um, I, I know this sounds super cliche, but I'm often inspired by ingredients. So if I have an idea for a dish, I'll, I'll start with what I'm going to use in it. And then, you know, my baseline usually starts with like, say, for instance, I have a vegetable, like Say I have a beet or a carrot, right? Mm-hmm. I'll take, I'll try and use every single part of it, you know, nose, nose to tail, or my friend Anthony at Casamona, the chef at Casamona, calls it root to shoot. <laughs> um, but, but that was that was one of being a Casamona. That was a place that sort of taught me to really exploit an ingredient for all it's worth, you know, to prevent to prevent waste, to all, but also to sort of amplify the flavor of that vegetable. So if you're doing something with a beet. You know, you can either roast the beet, you can usually, usually a roast or steam the beet. Um, then the beet tops, you would use either raw or saute them. The, the, um, the stems that, you know, the, the stems for the leaves, you would always pickle them. So that's like your, your starter. You would, you would start with taking that one ingredient. And that's kind of my, my inspiration when making a dish. I want, you know, sometimes it's, it's a downfall because I won't use more ingredients for something, but like a, like fennel, there was a time in LA when I was obsessed with fennel, and I would, you know, I would do a dish where there would be one protein that was cooked in a very, very simple way, like a pork cheek that was braised, and then I would do like eight things with the fennel. So I would make an, an oil with with seeds and the fronds. I would um, make a puree out of the bulb. I would, um, the you know, the stems. I would pickle, or I would, I would, you know, slice them super thinly and and deep fry them. You know, I would just sort of take the ingredient and kind of. Kind of, kind of pillage, pillage all of its parts. Sure, sure, yeah. You'd use everything to pay it the the utmost respect. Yes, that that, that you could, that you could, mm-hmm. and that's awesome. Um, now, now, obviously, you have access, as as you've mentioned, to some of the greatest ingredients in, in the world, and that's that's phenomenal. Um, t- trend wise, I'm sure you see them come and go. Um, yes. What is the next? big thing like i i i think it's safe to say from my last four or five episodes everyone's kind of on the farm to table kick and i think that's maybe a current movement in the industry is there something beyond that is there a next big thing coming down that we as lay people should know about i'll i'll tell i'll tell you what I, what i think i think farm to table is a given i think mm-hmm. that you know we always want to get the freshest we always want to get the most local we always want to get the highest quality that's that's a that shouldn't be – I don't even think that should be part of the discussion because I think that should just be implied. That shouldn't be a thing. That shouldn't be a thing. I mean, yes, it should be all farm to table. We should be getting our stuff you know, as much as, much as we can economically you know, you know, approach it. Our things should be from, you know, from local farms, from local purveyors that are of high quality, that are as organic as possible. But, you know, some people can't afford organic designations, it, you know. Sure. But you always want to start with with the best. But I don't know. I think I think that you know. I think that vegetables are becoming forefront, and I don't think that's going to be a trend. I think that's just going to be a way of life. I think that um, you know, 
ultimately it's more efficient for for the world for us to eat more vegetables right. um right. you know the amount of nutrition that you get from a, an acre of of land growing growing vegetables this is something that actually is funny when i was in fifth grade i went on a school trip an overnight trip and um i was talking to this guy about being a vegetarian one of the one of the counselors on this trip and you know I asked him why because I I loved food so much and 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 he told and this is it's is always sticking me I don't remember his name but I just remember having this conversation about how for the world it's more efficient to grow you know for the amount of nourishment that you can get an acre of plants than you can an acre of of land that you would need to oh, yeah. to raise an animal. Yep. So, you know, there's a lot of restaurants, especially in New York, there's a great restaurant here in Williamsburg called Samia, which um their focus is on vegetables and they use meat but more as as flavoring agents and stuff like that. So it's not vegetarian for the most part, but their their focus is on vegetables. And I think that that is going to be something that is going to be taking over. I mean, it also shows with our, our new place that we just opened in Los Angeles. We we just opened, I don't know if you know this, we opened a place called Ramen Hood. Yes, uh, I, I I saw that on the Book of Faith, and, and it's completely vegan ramen. It's a it's sort of the first of its kind, and and it, it that too, like many things in my life, have happened by accident. Um, you know, I'm not a vegan. Uh, I do, but I do think that the diversity in the plant world is so much greater than it is in, in the in the animal world. So I think that the things that you can achieve with plants have much more diversity than 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 they do with meat. Um, don't get me wrong. I'm cooking a turkey. You know, I've a turkey brining for Thanksgiving. I've, I'm I'm probably making sort of um, a pumpkin soup with some sort of smoked pork product. But but <laughs> you know, I really think that that vegetables are going to have to be more important in the future of of just the human race. Yeah. So I think that that's 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 the movement for me. That's where. That's where my mind's going, and that's where I think that a lot of chefs that are my contemporaries are going. Just because it's you, you can sort of you can grow more with it. Yeah, yeah, and it, 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 it's almost going to become a, a necessity. Yeah, in time. Um, anything that's that's going on today that you're ready to just see go away? That that you're just uh sick of. I mean, I can listen. I could say something, but then it's also a thing that I love, like you know, braised braised pork belly. That's <laughs> fried. It's delicious. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's kind of it's kind of everywhere. You know what I'm I'm getting a little bit tired of is that? is fried chicken. I love fried chicken, but it's like everybody has their their I'm um, my fried chicken recipe. My fried and I just fried chicken is getting a little bit, especially maybe it's just in New York, but it's like. Like people are, you know, I don't know. It's good. Listen, it's great. People are opening up fried chicken places and they're making tons of money. So who am I to say anything? I'm just, this right. is just a, a personal feeling. I'm kind of, I want a bit more diversity. You know, I love, I love all these ethnic restaurants that are, that have been open or opening up. I mean, you know, still my favorite place to eat in the world probably is, um, is Queens, Queens, New York. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just has such a ethnically diverse population and, it it really feels like the New York City of that the New York City that you think of in your mind, this this diverse place. You know, Manhattan is amazing and has the highest concentration of, of high end restaurants in the world, but it's but you know, for me, you know, especially on days off or when I have a moment, I, I like to eat I like to eat things from other other lands. Right on. Right on, totally. Yep. Yeah. Um so Career-wise, what's what's next? What's loaded in the chamber? I mean, obviously, Knife Fight's going well. Global's going well. You've got Ramen Hood at the Grand Central Market in L.A. I, anything else coming up that – Not – not yet, not yet. I've, I've got a lot on my plate right now. I mean, right. you know, we've got we've got a big change, a big changeover happening happening for the Gorbals um, that you'll you'll find out about in a few days. All right, um, but but it's good. It's all it's all positive. And, um, and yeah, I mean, we're just trying to, we're just trying, you know, we're trying to, trying to make these things work. Absolutely. It's, it's Absolutely. a tough, it's a tough landscape. New York is a, is a tough landscape, especially Williamsburg, because there's so many restaurants opening in such a small area and they're so there, you know, there haven't been an influx of people dining, you know, Manhattan for the most part still hasn't gotten the message that, 
you know, that Williamsburg is a place that you can come every night of the week. So, you know, it's, it's tough to compete with the big guns there and the big guns that are, that are surrounding us, you know, so it's a, it's a, it's a difficult market. It's different from LA. LA, we were, a, we were, um, unique in our, in our sort of delivery and, and what we were doing in our location. We were a very strange restaurant in a place that was being developed really, really quickly. And, um, and now, you know, in New York, we're not as, we're not as special. Right, so it's, right. it's an interesting, it's an interesting feeling, but, um, you know, I think we're doing great stuff. I'm proud of our, I'm proud of our food. I'm proud of our work. And yeah. I'm, I'm, all, I'm, I'm happy with the food and I'm happy to continue pushing and growing and changing. And, you know, I'm, I'm very, I'm one of those people that that's, it's not, not that I achieve perfection. I feel like nobody can really do that, but I'm always trying to keep it moving and change and keep it exciting as much as I possibly can for as a chef and, and as a business person, you know, trying to keep, keep our customers excited or, you know, that, that's what I try to do. Excellent. Excellent, man. Um, so l last section after is truncated version because Chef Elon Hall is a busy, busy man. Um, I'm standing in your kitchen, um, professionally or at home, you can pick. And I kind of feel like I have an inside track on this based on a uh, post I saw earlier. What music would I hear in your kitchen? Uh, <laughs> this morning. Um, I saw the R. Kelly was... thing. So Yes, R, <laughs> R. Kelly a lot. Um, Action Bronson a lot. Uh, my son and I woke up to, uh, to, we put on a little bit of DMX in the morning to get him ready for school. <laughs> nice. Um, just, just cause you know, sometimes you just need a little X in your life. You need a little X in your life. That's right. Yeah. Um, um I mean a lot, a lot of hip hop, a lot of nineties R and B, um, that's sort of, you know, music I grew up with and music that I love to listen to. Right on, right on. Um, hypothetical situation. You're stranded on a deserted Island. You can only take three foods or food type items with you what would they be and why haagen vanilla ice cream because it's one of the most delicious things in the world <laughs> um really crispy endless supply of uh french fries nice with um with QP mayonnaise mm -hmm. uh three I don't know, i'm always lost on my third i would i guess i would say I mean, this is a hypothetical. This is, I, I would say probably, um, probably bacon, Newski's nice. bacon. Nice. nice. I mean, you have to think about what, you know, what you're going to want when you're all alone and you're sad and you're, you're, you're on an island by yourself. You know, you're not really caring about, about the rest. The rest of the stuff I'll forage for, you know, I'll eat some leaves and shit. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, ha have you uh, checked out Melanie Dene on My Last Supper? No. Ever. Okay. So, so it's a two volume book, 50 famous chefs ask the same string of questions where the inspiration for the podcast came from. Um, mm -hmm. and she poses basically, you know, you're checking out tomorrow. What's your dinner music and everything today. So I ask you, what would be your ideal last supper? Similar, similar to what I just told you. Agonaz vanilla and bacon. <laughs> Agonaz vanilla and bacon. Um, my last supper, <laughs> Let me th give me a second. Um, my last supper, I would I would definitely want slices of Nooski's bacon. I would definitely want haagen vanilla. I would definitely want crispy French fries. Um, I think I would go with um, probably a banh mi sandwich. Nice. Uh, shit, this is my last. I gotta. This is important. Um, you should be I, in the third book, by the way, just in case Melanie's I, listening. You should be in the third book. Please, please yes. put me in. Um, unless I don't give a good answer, then then it sucks. Then yeah. I shouldn't. Um, <laughs> um, I would pro uh, definitely some Iberico ham. Nice. Um, I know it's already two pork products. Well, that um, and and that was just on uh, knife fight, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. It was. That was one of the best fights we ever had. Honestly, that was fucking so amazing. Good. I'm sorry. So that was amazing. Thanks. But um, what else, man? Um, I probably want some like some like yellowtail sushi, just like fatty and simple and delicious. Um. Uh, you know, made by, made by Jiro, of course. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, I mean, you know what? One of the best dishes that I think I've ever had in my life was, um, this is super complex, I guess. Like, you know, it'd be awesome if they flew Renee Redzepi out to, to do my last meal. <laughs> but, um, I had, 
I had a, a dish on on the tasting menu when I was when the one time I went to Noma that was um this it was a, a juice made from fermented barley or not from it was like like um like uh mold mold inoculated barley that they age and it tastes like Iberico ham so it was this like clear liquid with very simply cooked new Danish potatoes and um and lump fish roe and it was one of the most delicious things I've ever eaten in my life Holy and I, I can't really I can't really place it why but it was just so perfect like the textures the temperature and just the flavor of everything together was perfect that's awesome that is awesome yeah. um and finally, Chef, uh, last question again. I know you got to roll. Um, simplest sure. question, but the most complex. What is food to you in one word? Food is... Food is life. Food is life. And I totally agree. I totally agree. That's probably... Um, that's definitely an answer you hear, and yet, how else could you define it, right? I mean, yeah, food is the world, food is everything, food is life, food is, food is universe. Food is universe, food is life. Fabulous, fabulous. Well, Chef, again, I know you got to bail, but thank you so much for taking the time to uh, My pleasure. stop in with me today. Um, any places I can, any places or things, rather, I can plug for you? We've got Robin Hood, uh, Robin. Central Market, L.A., Plug plug Ramen Hood hard. That's okay. that's what we're that's what we're doing right now. Ramen Hood is is kicking ass, and um, that's really that's really you know that that's our big focus right now. We're really having a, having a great time there and making delicious stuff. Awesome, Ramen Hood hit it hard. Uh, Gorbel's Brooklyn, ninety eight North Sixth Street, seven one eight three eight seven zero one nine five, and yep. Knife Fight Esquire Night Esquire Network rather Tuesdays nine p.m. Eastern eight Central. Um, again, Chef, can't thank you enough. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate it too. It was great. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this has been episode number 25 of the Course Grind Podcast. My producer, Reverend John Johnny Lamoria, aka Johnny Robinson. Check out his podcast, Cinematic Pig's Feet. My guest, again, the Chef Elon Hall. Um, of so many things, I can't list them again. Next episode, episode 26. Be sure to tune in. We'll catch you then. Take care.